years now. Uh, you can go to our webpage, cbctruth.com, cbcwebsite.com, and centerreachbiblechurch.com. They all take you to the same website, and you can give safely and securely to the work. Uh, we're going to get right to it. We're going to go to Psalm 119. Hey, what a surprise. Psalm, one, Psalm 119. We're going to begin with verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, what an honor it is to come before you, Lord, with many or few people, Lord. doesn't matter. When your word is preached, Lord, lives are changed, hearts are moved, fears are comforted, truth is spoken, answers are given, things change, Lord. And we pray that you would be with us this evening and change us, Lord. Open up our hearts. Let us learn even more. We never know enough. We never, never know enough, Lord. Let us learn more about you. Uh, we pray, as always, give the winds a mighty voice and take this message to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond, and if not there, to those listening at home, and if not there, to those right here. And if not to them, take it to me. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight, this is week 31. You guys are pretty faithful, sticking with us for 31 weeks, part 31 of Psalm 119. Uh, tonight, we're just going to do one verse. Last week, we took a big chunk. We're just going to do verse 94. But before we get to that, a couple of things. The title is called Save Me, Please. And uh, a very important topic that we're going to be talking about tonight. And not always what you think it's going to be, but it is very important. But a little background of Psalm 119, it is the Psalm of all Psalms, 176 verses. Uh, a diary, a personal diary of King David towards the end of his life, all he learned about God uh, as he served him. Sometimes it's called, happy are those whose way is perfect. Uh, happy are those who live as God wants them to. That is God's promise. But anyway, tonight, verse 94, save me please. And why is that so hard to say? You know, it's a problem. It's not easy to say save me or help me. And uh, we're going to talk about that tonight because that's one of our issues. But anyway, tonight, just going to take on one verse. And yet, it's going to bring us to a massively very important conclusion which is this, a well, conclusion and a question. A, we need to be saved, in case you don't know that. And number two, only God can save to the uttermost and explain what that means. Well, a fireman can save you from a fire, right? A policeman can save you from danger. An EMT can save you from death. Our brother Andrew just uh, last week as an EMT Somebody's heart stopped, and he had to get the heart started again. He saved someone's life. Uh, but only God can save to the fullest extent, meaning only God can save us eternally, forever. And from the biggest issue of all, I mean, we need to be saved from a lot of things. I know each week I need to be saved. But the biggest issue of all that God has saved us from is our own sins which because of them, if they're not paid for, uh, they send us to hell. But Jesus did that for us. He paid for our sins. But I have another question also. Is that all that God is good for, just so we don't go to hell and we go to heaven when we die? Is he saving us any other time uh, during the day, during the week? And the answer is yes. He's constantly saving. He's constantly doing things. And he's constantly working in our daily lives. How many of us here, you know, we should probably, you know, one night have, I, I always say this, have a night when people just give testimonies. I mean, how many of us can say, man, I should have been dead. I should have been in a bad car accident. I don't know how I got out of that. But I'm here. You know, I, you know there's so many times people, believe me, if God didn't want you alive, you wouldn't be here. He is constantly keeping us alive. And we don't, we don't thank him enough. We don't, you know, we don't acknowledge, wow, God, that was a real close call. I really got, got out of something pretty bad, and I didn't even realize it so many times. He does it to us. 
So the point is, God does also save us from daily danger. But always remember, he does it according to his will for you, his will for you, but also his will for himself. If God has work for you to do, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay alive until your work is finished. So no one can kill you or stop you unless God says you're done. So if, people, if you're worried about dying, then you shouldn't be. But if you are and you want to stick around longer, be useful to God. Because God will make sure there's, well, you're around for a long, long time. Just make sure you keep doing his work. Funny story about this term saved. Now, as Christians, we throw, away the, we throw around this term, you know, I got saved. The person, are, are you saved? You know, as a Christian, you run into people and you say, you know, sometimes instead of saying, are you a Christian? We say, hey, are you saved? And people hear us who don't know these terms go, what the heck are you guys talking about? Saved. True story. Years ago, there were, uh, we had an elder here named Bob Cortez. And uh, he's still alive. He's serving God down in Florida. Uh, matter of fact, we support uh, his son and his wife, uh, their missionaries. Daughter. His son. No, his, his daughter and son-in-law, uh, Chris and Craig, who are missionaries to Wycliffe Bible Translators. They're one of our missionaries. But this is the story I, I heard many, many years ago, before Bob was a Christian. His daughter, and I think it was Chris, uh, was out on a boat with her friends and she was in her early teens and when she came home from that boat trip she burst through the door and she said dad guess what he goes what I got saved today and Bob's first reaction was oh no did you fall off, off the boat what happened are you okay he goes no 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 not like that she goes I was saved by Jesus I was saved from my sins. I'm a child of God now. I'm a Christian. Now, Bob didn't get that for a long time, but the fact that he ended up <laughs> becoming an elder in this church proves that eventually he did get it through one of his children coming to Christ. And that's an amazing story, and we hear many stories like that. But anyway, back to our title, Save Me, Please. And why is that so hard to say? You know, it's a funny thing that it seems so simple to say, save me or help me. But it's, it's pretty complicated because we have a reluctance to ask for that. Uh, very few people will ever admit that they need to be saved or that they need to even be helped. And why is that? Why do we have this reluctance? Why do people, you know, lately, we, the big talk is, and as I did that study Wednesday night about atheism and evolution and agnostics, and, you know, what's the big deal with atheists? You know, down, deep down in their heart is they don't want to admit that they need anything but themselves. And to come to the logical conclusion, which there is no doubt at all, it is a thousand percent prove, provable and proved, it is evident, it is good science, there is a creator, there is an intelligent being. But why won't they come to Christ? I was talking to uh, somebody at the church today, and I said, Pastor, he goes, if you get a chance, you know, I know what to do, I have this friend of mine, and this person who's talked to me, is a new believer, but loves the Lord, um, really excited about this person and they say this person knows a lot about science and they once were a Christian but they, they they're throwing all these things about space-time continuums and matter and science I don't know how to answer them oh, what should I do and you know they're really beating me up with this and I said well first of all the reason why they're beating you up with it because they know they're hunting a rabbit a little bunny with the shotgun and you're easy prey. I said, if they really, really want to know those answers, I said, show them the, the, the YouTube we did Wednesday. And if they're really interested, and it's always, because I always hear this from people, I have this friend, he's Mr. Science, and well, let him come see me. I said, have him come down, make an appointment, and you know, let's, let's talk about it. Most of those people 
never will. You know why? Because they don't want to know the truth. They don't want to know. Because deep down in our hearts, people, any logical person knows you were made, you were designed, and you have purpose. And if you were made, that means something bigger than you made you. And that means you're less than them. And we don't want to know that. So pray for people like that. You know what? I don't, I don't want to beat anybody up. I just love to, well, let's, really? That's how you feel? Well, let's talk about it, logically, okay? Because people can throw stuff, if, if they know you're intimidated and you're afraid, they're going to throw all kinds of stuff at you. And if you don't have answers, uh, they're going to beat up you more, even more. And then you're going to walk away feeling, gee, I, I didn't do, you know what? I always remember what we did Wednesday night. Bring a couple of blocks with you. Carry a bunch of wooden blocks. Okay? You can say, well, all I know is one plus one plus one equals three. Okay? Those are the facts. I look around. I see the planet that we live on. If there's a planet, there's a planet maker. As simple as that. You can go off in all your quantum physics and everything. And I could talk quantum physics. You want to talk that stuff? Let's talk it. It all goes back to a divine, intelligent creator. There's no way around it. No way. So it's really pride, people, that keeps us from asking for help. Ignorance keeps us from asking for help. And foolishness keeps us from asking for help. Even simple help. People, we will never ask for help or ask to be saved unless we know there's something to be saved from. And that's, the, that's why it's so, so important to preach the full gospel, because if people don't understand, well, what, saved from what? From the judgment, from the penalty. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. There is a consequence. All this is going on in our world and in our hearts. There's a consequence unless it's taken care of by God. But if you don't know that, why do I need to be saved? Which in turn, you know what? Many, many people spend their whole lives, even after coming to Christ. How many people you know have come to Christ? They're Christians, yet they don't like help. Okay? I don't need any help. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. They refuse to admit they need help. And as to hell itself, Many will spend a Christless eternity simply because they said, I don't need to be saved. I don't need to be forgiven. I don't need any of that. And that's their own choice. And we can say to that, what a foolish, foolish game this is. I know many, many people, many people, as a, as a Christian counselor, as a therapist, who hate, you know, people that I know, that it just frustrates me because they hate to ask for help. Now, I'm not talking about people who don't want to bother me and they take care of their own issues. No, if they truly have a problem, they don't want to ask for help because they believe that's a sign that they're not smart enough or they don't know what to do. It's their pride. And because they refuse to admit they need help, and that they don't know everything. You ever run into people like that at work, on the job, on your family, know everything about anything, about everything. No matter what you say, they know everything about it ten times over. There's always, they can always top you. I remember this one guy, I, I knew he was a Christian, you know, and we talk about cars and stuff, and, you know, and I peg these people right away, so I said, oh, wow, that's great. I, I don't argue with them. You know, if I said I had a, you know, a 350 Chevy, well, I had a 351. You know, whatever horsepower car I had, he had a bigger horsepower car. Whatever I did as a kid, he did it. I said, that's great. You, you beat me. Awesome. You are the best. Of the best. I don't know what to tell you. You ever been in an argument? Especially happens with men. You know, it's like they've got to tell you. If you've been to, well, I've been to 10 states in the, in the country. Well, I've been to 20 states. Okay, you win. You are the best, you know. And you'll find with people like that, they have really have inferiority complexes. They never, you can never beat them. And you shouldn't try to be. Let's let them win because they live in their own delusion. 
But the problem is, is they don't want to ask for help. And that's, that's pride, people. It's pride. And they choose disaster after disaster after disaster simply because they are being foolish and prideful. If you don't know how to do something, ask someone. And I tell you, as an adult, or well, if you're an adult and you haven't learned this yet, then you never really grew up. Because as an adult, one thing I have learned, I don't mind asking for help if I don't know what I'm doing. As a young person, you want to know, I mean, it's a typical thing. If you're a young person, every young person knows everything. Right? They, they, they always say when you get to be a teenager, you, you, you have all this wisdom, you know everything. Oh, mom and dad, you don't know nothing about this. You know, mom and dad know nothing. And all of a sudden, as a young person, young adults, you know, they believe they know everything. And it's interesting, and I've shared this before, isn't it funny you watch all the news, all the protests and all the crazy stuff, who's doing it? Young adults. They know everything about everything. You don't see some person in a walker out there with a sign protesting. It's all young adults who just seem to think that they know everything and no one could ever tell them, you know, you might be wrong about that. No, I, am, I know everything. In reality, what does it really prove is that we're children. Because what's the first, remember when our kids were really small? Remember the first things they would say when you want to show them? I, I don't know how old it would be, my wife would know better, three or four years old. I do, I do. Remember, you'd show them that, I do, Daddy, I do. I do. They know how to do everything. Because all of a sudden they get excited that they could, you know, get up on a chair and you try to help them. I do, I do. People, when we start doing that, I do, I do. I need no help. You're not showing how smart you are. You're showing how immature you are. Because if you don't know something, say it. One of the most important things I learned as a mechanic, I've been a mechanic all my life, as far back as I can remember, is, you know, my father gave me my first set of tools. I still have them. I was just watching a special on uh, this Farpoint. It's one of, this, one of these YouTube guys who compares tools and talking about the best wrenches and stuff. I still have, um, on my 16th birthday, or maybe 13th, I don't remember, my father gave me my first toolbox, and it was all SK tools, which are pretty good tools. And I still have those tools. I still have that, you know, original wrench and ratchet and the little boxes. And it's interesting, as a young mechanic, I had the mentality, I do, I do. I know what I'm doing. And I would hate when someone would show me how to do something, how to do breaks, how to do this, how to do that. But it wasn't until I got older and I realized, you have a better way of doing this? Please let me know. Because <laughs> I'm struggling here. And it's a hard thing because as you get older, in my last job before I was a pastor, it was, you know, I had a pretty high-end job and I was supposed to know a lot more than I actually did. And... You know, I didn't want to tell people that I didn't know, but it came to a point where I was, you know, working on really expensive equipment. It's, you know, so like our brother Jim there, he works on airplane engines. You don't want to just wing it and say, ah, I guess this is where this goes. I don't want to ask anybody because they're going to look. You know, if you're working on something important, you don't just, you know, you say, you know what, I'm not really sure where this goes. Can somebody, you know, there'll always be the guys who will make fun of you, but there'll always be the older guys who will say, it's smart to ask that, right? You know, I've been doing brakes on cars or oil change or whatever. I, I remember the first time, you know, you're doing tune-ups as a kid at my father's gas station. You know, the first thing you do if you ever did a tune-up is you pull out all the spark plugs and all the wires and then put it back. And I go, hey, Dad, I, I don't know where these spark plug wires go. He goes, well, why did you pull them all out? Okay. You pull one out at a time. You put that one. Then you do the next one. It's the same like with brakes. He would always tell me, like back in the day when we did drum brakes, all those springs and stuff. He goes, always leave one side together. So you, because in the beginning, I rip everything out. Okay, now I'm going to, I don't know how to put it back together again. You always have something to look out, you know, look for. Today, it's pretty cool. I, I've learned people do it. I take pictures with my phone now. 
if I'm going to take something apart, and I'm, because my memory is like, I'm taking a picture of this thing. So if I don't remember where that goes, I look at the picture. Doesn't mean I'm stupid, it means I'm smart. But some people just don't ever want to say, I don't know what to do. But anyway, to our scripture tonight, uh, that was the big introduction, half an hour introduction here. Our one scripture tonight, someone, uh, Psalm 119, 94. Let's go there. Psalm 119, 94. It says, and now this is King David speaking. He says, I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. Now, we're going to break down this scripture, and we're going to, you, know, you, you might say, well, it's just one verse. What's really going on here? Well, actually, a lot. Because David makes three important conclusions. Number one, and, and it, proves, it proves that he's a very smart man. Number one, he's humble enough to know that I am a child of God. Not because of what I've done, but because of what God has done for me. So he acknowledges, I am yours, God. You're mine, I'm yours, and, and that's just the way it is. And I have no reason to worry about if... Uh, if I'm God's child. No, I am. I've trusted him. He saved me. It's a done deal. I don't have to think upon that. So he lays that on the side. I'm a child of God. I never have to question that again. Number two, he points out, I need to be saved. Now, he, in this uh, account here, he's not talking about saved from going to hell or stuff like that. He's He's, you know, every one of these scriptures is speaking about a life event in David's life where he probably said, God, save me from this problem. This is big. I don't know what to do. He's acknowledging I'm in a situation that's bigger than me. And I need you to save me out of this. And then he concludes in point three, for I have sought thy precepts. Meaning, God, I know I'm your child. I know I'm in trouble right now, but I know that I always seek you out. That's where I need to go. What do I do? I'm trusting in you. Now, when we don't do that, what's the old saying? Well, it's not an old saying. It's actually from the Bible. You know what? People, people quote this, and they don't realize it's from the Scripture. How does it go? Pride goeth before a fall. It's from the Bible. Those who lift themselves up with pride, God, God says, guaranteed, you will be brought low. Those who humble themselves will be lifted up. I have to tell you, in my life as a Christian, people say, you know, God works in your life. One of the surest things that every, I have never seen something that God is such a stickler for. He proves this in my life every day. Every time I boast or I brag about something and I'm prideful, I end up looking like a fool and I'm exposed and God humbles me. And every time I humble myself and say, I really don't know, God help me get through this, He loves the humility. He, lives, he lifts me up. Next thing you know, people are praising me and, and lifting me up. Every time. So I've learned, you know what, I do not like to boast or brag. And if you've been around here, you know I do the opposite because I've learned I'd rather pick on myself and let God lift me up than brag about myself and have God bring me down. I'd rather say, you know what? I don't know. I really don't know. <clears throat> but let's take a deeper look at this word here or this phrase, to save. I looked up the word or the phrase to save it's listed 30, which isn't that many times in the entire Bible. 38 times it's mentioned in the Bible when God saves. In the Old Testament, the word, when you see the term to save, I called on God to save me. Uh, the word is yasha. It means to open wide or free, to be safe. Uh, to free or secure a safe place. In the New Testament, the word is zodzo. It means to save or to deliver or protect. To heal, preserve, save self, do well, make whole. And out of those 38 scriptures, well, 
we're going to go over them in this remaining half an hour. Not all of them, but most of them. And I, I went through the Bible and I picked out specific times, Old Testament knew, when God's people were in a situation and they needed to be saved. They called out to God to be saved and God saved them. Okay, we're not talking salvation here. We're talking get me out of this jam. Okay, so we start way back, and these will be in, sequ in sequential order, so it makes it easier for you guys. So we start way back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. My, my kids, when they were small, used to say, Deuteronomy, Dad? Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 4. For the Lord, your God is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Now, these are the scriptures I give tonight. If you have your own Bibles, I would highlight these and put arrows. These are good keepers. So when you flip through your Bibles, you know, I, my Bible is so marked up. When I flip through it in desperate times, I always have stuff that I highlighted. Oh, that's a great scripture, and it'll pop out. So Deuteronomy is a great one. God goes with you. What does that mean? You don't go anywhere alone. No matter where you go, even to bad places, he's there. And he will fight for you against what? Your enemies. To do what? To save you from their clutches. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. And Jonathan, Jonathan, best friends with King David, by the way, said to the young men that bear his armor, Come. And let us go over unto the garrison of the uncircumcised, those who were not followers of God. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Isn't that a great scripture? Jonathan is telling his troops, guys, we have to face this army. And God, nothing holds him back. There is nothing that scares him that's too big. And he can save us with many people or with a few amounts of people. He doesn't need a lot of things. He chooses what he wants. Second Kings 19.33, By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Interesting. God says, David, you have a battle to face. You're entering into a dangerous place. Always remember this. When God delivers you, he's not just delivering you for you. He's delivering you for himself. Because if he, he has more work for you, he's got to deliver you. He wants you safe because he has things for you to do. So he tells David, I will defend the city, okay? Don't worry about it. Yes, you're going to have to go, but I'm going to be fighting the battles. I'm going to do it for my own sake. And for you, David, because I love you, David, I'm also going to do it for you. I'm going to save you. Save you from this really bad situation. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 20. The Lord, and always remember, guys, I'll give you a little test. Every time we see the word Lord, uppercase, letters, what does that mean? God Almighty. God Almighty, God's name, His personal name, Yahweh, the great I Am. So, the Lord uh, was ready to save me. Therefore, will we sing my songs to the, uh, to the string instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Meaning, that's why we sing praises. Well, number one, God likes it. You know, God likes music. He likes to be sung to. He does. He likes it. For some reason, he's God. That's what he says. So, we do it. And he likes it when we thank him for when he saves us, even before he saves us. David knew that. Isaiah knew that. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11, the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the chicken prophet. Uh, he wasn't a brave guy, but he served God. Jeremiah 30, verse 11. It says, for I am with thee. This is God speaking to Jeremiah, saith the Lord. To save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whether I scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure 
and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Now we can look at that as God directing that towards Israel, or we could actually apply that to our own lives. God says, I'm going to save you from this dilemma you're in right now, and I'll take care of all the enemies. I'll make sure you're not over, but I'll do it in the proper measurement. Because if you stick your finger in the outlet too many times, I might let, have to let you get a shock. So you get it. Okay, so I save you from death, but sometimes God doesn't save us from the stupid things that we do. So we realize, oh, I won't learn that unless I stop doing it. Okay, Jeremiah 42, 11. This is a great one when we're afraid which is many times. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon. And we could apply that any person who is in big power, anything that you're afraid of, God says, be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Now, what is, what is the prophet Jeremiah saying here? God already knows who we're afraid of. We might say, I'm not afraid of anything. God says, yes, you are. You're afraid of that king. Don't tell me you're not. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you. There it is again. And to deliver you from his hand. Now, God might use mechanized weapons and soldiers, but at the end of the day, the victory is through God because I'm going to save you because I promised. As we go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 18, verse 11, Jesus says, the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. The ministry of God, the whole thing of God, what's God's whole plan to save mankind from himself? Okay, I've set you guys up and you just went bananas and I have come to save you. The first time, especially, okay, I came to, and we're going to see this more. Matter of fact, go to Luke 9.56, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Gospel of Luke. What made Luke special? What, what was Luke? What was Luke's profession? A doctor. He was a physician. Luke was a physician. Matthew was a tax collector. You know, God used all different people from different walks of life. You know, he was like, Matthew would be like the IRS guy. Not really liked by many people. <laughs> okay. Luke was a physician. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And then they went into another village. Always remember, God is not here to make your life miserable. Number one, He's saving us from our own sins. He's saving us from an eternity without Him. And He's saving us so we can do more for Him. Save us from from our own insanity sometimes, from our mistakes. Go to John, Matthew, Luke, John, the Gospel of John. John wasn't, what was John? He was a blue-collar worker guy, okay, fisherman. John 12, 47, And if any man, and I'm now this is Jesus speaking again, And if any man hear my word and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. There's that saving again. And this is an interesting word uh, because what is Jesus saying? Well, he's talking about his first time when Jesus came around 2022 years ago. Why did he come? Not to judge the world at that time, that time, but to save them from what's coming and from their own sins and it's interesting, he says, if any man hear my words and believe it not, I don't judge you. You don't want to listen right now? You don't want to believe? That's up to you right now. One day when you die, you're going to be judged. Okay? Because did you ever wonder, you know, lately, again, we've been talking about atheists and stuff. You know, you tell people about this, I don't believe this nonsense. God says, fine, let them go. They don't believe it. And, and did you ever wonder why your friends who don't know God, they do all kinds of bad things, they're evil, and they're stealing, and they're cheating on their taxes. They never get a court. For the most part, they get away. It's like, God, why aren't you dealing with them? Because I'm not judging them. 
They get to do whatever they want to do. I'm not dealing with them. And that's why people say, hey, crime pays, man. I haven't paid my taxes in 25 years. This is great. Well, one day it'll catch up to you. So if you ever get angry, gee, I do everything right. I, I give my right money to church. I work hard. I do all this stuff. I do one thing wrong. Man, I'm punished. My friends, they do whatever they want to do, and their life seems to be just great. God says, don't fool for that. That's because I am not punishing them because they're not my children. They get to do whatever they want. A lot of times people say, why doesn't God do something right now and take care and judge all these bad people? He goes, because it's not the time to judge them. Right now, they're doing whatever they, they have their free will. One day, they will be judged. But I came here first to save them. When Jesus comes back the second time, it's a whole different ball game. When people say, why doesn't God do something and come back and fix this? He is. He will. <laughs> and he's going to lay into all these people who mocked and did all these horrible, horrible things. They're going to have to pay. So don't think anyone, you know, they're getting away with, they're not getting away with anything. They'll all have to stand before God one day. You won't. I won't. Isn't that a great thing? At least not for judgment. There'll be no judgment on us because we're forgiven. We're children of God. Uh, let's see here. Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy as we go on in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. We were in uh, 1 Timothy this morning. Paul says to Timothy, this is a faithful saying. Take, you could take it to the bank. Worthy of all acceptation. Trust it. You can trust it. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And what does Paul say? Whom I am chief. What is Paul making the point? We're all sinners. We all need to be saved. No matter how good you think they are. I mean, Apostle Paul, man. I mean, you think, gee, Apostle Paul, he's a great guy, righteous guy. Yeah, Paul said, you know what? You think I'm apostle? He goes, I'm a wretch. I'm a wretch. But that's why Jesus came, to forgive me and save me. James chapter 4, verse 12. James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Always an interesting fella. Grew up with Jesus. He hated Jesus as a little boy and as a young man. He was one of uh, them who would not believe that Jesus was God and the Messiah. And I don't believe it. I live with the guy. He's nobody. And he probably hated his brother, half-brother, because Jesus... Can you imagine if you were a kid and your sibling never did anything wrong? Jesus was the perfect kid. And he had sisters, too. The Bible you know, gives us information. He had other kids in his family. But he was the only one whose father was God. Can you imagine the other kids in his family going, there's Jesus again, never does anything wrong, always helping mom out, always helping dad out. You know, every, they're all out getting in trouble and he's cleaning his room. There's Jesus. You probably would hate him. You know? And James didn't like him at all. But yet James came to an enlightening when he, said, when he saw the risen Christ. He goes, wow. Jesus is God. And James says in verse 4, 12, there is one lawgiver, one authority, he's basically saying, who is able to save and able to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Who is he speaking about? Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can save and can destroy if he has to. And obviously he's pointing out be careful when we judge other people on what they're doing wrong. Let's take care of ourselves here, judge ourselves. So what do we learn here? Number one, people, we need to be saved. Yes, for our, for, from our sins. So we go to heaven when we die. We accept Christ's work on the cross. Bam, you're a child of God forever. It cannot change. But second, we need to be saved every day from ourselves our daily struggles and sins and prides and egos. 
And third, we need to be saved daily from this evil world because it is a mess. And number four, this is interesting, and I thought it was funny to word it this way, but I was thinking, you know what else we need to be saved from? We need to be saved from not thinking we need to be saved from our pride. I don't need help. I don't need this. I'm fine. Leave me alone. God says, stop it. Just stop it. You don't know everything. You don't know everything. Come to me and let that pride go. It'll alleviate so much burden and misery in your life. So, in conclusion, do all of these. And great will be your daily joy and certainly your eternal joy. But it's hard. People, that's the hard thing. And this is interesting. It is hard to say, I need help. But that's a problem. If it's hard to say, I need help, why? Matter of fact, I'm going to even say, if you're a person who's, who has a problem saying, I need help, I don't know how to do this, then you have something wrong. And you will be in misery over and over again because something is not quite right with you. We need to be able to get used to saying, I don't understand this. I don't know how to do this. Can you show me how to do this? That is a sign of great character. And to ignore it and rebel it is a sign of great immaturity. So let's get used to saying it. Get used to saying the words that we hate to say that I don't know what I'm doing sometimes. I don't know the answer sometimes. God, I need you to save me every day from me. Because we all know who's our worst enemy? Us. We are our own worst enemies. We either beat ourselves up too much or we try to think we're, we're more than we are too much. And God says, just chill out. Humble yourselves in the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up and do time. And when we do, great will be our reward. And what's our reward? Peace. Because again, God says, I bring down the proud, I lift up the humble every single time. Humility, I mean, I preach it all the time. No one likes it because no one wants it. And no one doesn't get the joy of understanding the blessing of humility. I screwed up. I made a mistake. I did a dumb thing. I don't know where I'm going. I don't understand this. Can you help me? Can you show me the way? God says, bravo. You know why he says bravo? Because that is so hard to do. Because everyone wants to think they know everything. And that trait can send us right to hell when we say, I don't need God to forgive me for my sins because what did I do wrong? Nothing. God says, that's where it starts. That's where it starts. If you don't think you need to be forgiven, then you will certainly never think you need help from anyone. Let's humble ourselves in the mighty hand of God and he will lift us up, the Bible says, in due time. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, help us, Lord, to know we need to be saved, to know we need to be forgiven, to know we need help. Help us to say those words that keep so much joy from us. Why do we refuse your help? Why do we refuse people's help? Why do we refuse to admit that we don't know things sometimes and we just lay upon ourselves burdens and problems and struggles and we wonder why am I having all these issues and it just comes down to pride father I need to be saved every single day and I'm glad that I am saved for eternity that's taken care of and anyone who calls upon Christ as Lord and Savior and trusts on his work on the cross you're saved forever it's the done deal let it go you're forgiven but on a daily basis, we still need to be saved from the dangers of this world, but mostly from ourselves. 
Help us to get used to admitting, I don't know what to do. Fix me. Show me the way. And when we do, you do. And great is that reward. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. We finished early tonight. Okay, good. Let's stand and we'll close with a song.